we're starting, so please take a seat. Uh, I'm kind of hoping that there will be more people actually coming after lunch, or, you know, just after lunch. So, yeah, the people who are here are the best people, so that you know. And uh, actually, I wanted to introduce Kuhn. So Kuhn is at, uh, from CMU, and uh, he's been doing causality since 2006. I actually discovered recently. And uh, I mean, he doesn't like to say it because he's very humble, but I would like to say that I think, as, as far as I know at least, he's the first one to do causality and transfer learning together since 2013. Maybe we can argue on that. Maybe Elias has some ideas. <laughs> we never know. <laughs> but I mean, he's clearly uh, very good, and I think this talk will be very interesting to all of us. Oh. Oh, no, you have a Thank you very much. You are so nice, Sarah. And by the way, I'm the first among those people who are doing our work. So basically, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, in this talk, you can see essentially how we can connect causality with independence, and then how we can do adaptive prediction or transfer learning in a causal and non-causal way. Basically, I will start with this, this example. So in 2015, this system called Google, uh, sorry, uh, photo categorization system developed by Google Photos made some huge mistakes, right? The system basically tagged two African Americans as gorillas, right? This is really a huge mistake. So they use deep learning. They really try to identify to, to do classification. Why? What, what caused the problem? And after almost three years, two and a half, almost, almost three years, they saw, finally, they solved the problem. How did they solve it? Do you have a clue? How did they solve the problem? Sorry? Human label? Human label? That's one way they didn't use it, because they want to use the automatic system. To us, this is very simple. And finally, they solved the problem by removing the label. Yeah. You want to say that, right? <laughs> so by removing the label from the label set, by removing the gorilla label from the label set, you can see they spend very much time. They really want to solve the problem. The problem is very easy for us to solve, but for the computer, deep learning system is so hard. Why? And similarly, we know the adversarial attack problem, right? So after you add some noise, all of a sudden, it's not a panda anymore, right? So what caused the problem? Basically, roughly speaking, this is just because the machines are using a different set of features than what we use, right? We use this kind of features. We derive the features in some way. Machines just use the features that are very useful for prediction implied by the training data. That's all. So basically, we use a different set of features. Now, we say we are intelligent. We want machines to be intelligent. What's the intelligence? Traditional machine learning, machine learning basically assumes that you have data training data, and that the test data are from the same distribution, right? Basically, you have a single distribution. That's why you can learn something here and apply the same thing in the future. In practice, almost all the time, this is wrong, right? For, for us, for human beings, if you play badminton very well, you can easily learn to, to uh, play ping pong, and you can quickly play, very, uh, play it very well. You, you know how to decompose the whole skill set into some small modules, and you can automatically do the transfer. For human beings, right? For human driver, you can easily identify or make the right decision, even if this is a completely new scenario, because you can see the essential part of the input of the feature, and you can draw the connection between this kind of essential representation and your experience, something in your experience. We can do that. Overall, for a machine to be intelligent, we have to basically um, ask for the following thing. First of all, the system should have the ability to understand what's going on. I'm not giving a definition of understanding later. I will try to, I will try to do so. Basically, the machine has the ability to understand what's going on. And because of that, the machine is able to do con control intervention. The machine can automatically decompose a complex situation, complex task, into a lot of simple modules. And the machine can do information theory. You mentioned theorem. Basically, you can just put together information uh, or pictures you learn from different scenarios in different situations, and then you can form a bigger overall picture. And you can learn with a few examples. In a new scenario, right, you can really see the connection between the scenario and the previous ones. Then you can do something with very few level data points. 
you can do not only interpolation, but also extrapolation, right? Even if the data point is not contained in the training set, you can really see the connection. You can make use of the connection. So we can do a lot of things. What is intelligence? We just talk about a lot of phenomena uh, related to intelligence. How can we really achieve that? How can we define intelligence? Basically, what's intelligence? Some people may say, may say so, okay, I can see exactly how brain work, and then I can try to build something to mimic that. I don't think this is really the right way to achieve intelligence because there are so many ways, right? We just care about the input output. We don't care about the, the particular detail in the system. Then how can you define intelligence? Basically, you can build this problem from the um, evolution, selection, and the growth perspective. We, now we want to define intelligence because we have those capacities. Now we want a machine to have the same capacities. What capacities? First of all, we survived, right? We survived different scenarios, meaning that we have the ability to make good prediction or good decisions across different scenarios, across all scenarios, right? Statistically speaking, this means we have to come up with some inner compact representation of the external world. You see different things. You want, really want to see, analyze, see, and encode the connection between different scenarios, between different tasks, and so on. So we can do this. Second of all, we are creative in some way. That's why we can uh, create new things and we, we are powerful, right? So creativity, clearly to be creative, you have to make use of causal representation because you want to make intervention, you want to change something to achieve your goal. And we prosper, right? That's why we define intelligence. We want to do something, we want to uh, develop something that behaves similar to us, right? So we prosper because we are creative and we survive. Now, we want to um, create some machine that has abilities. What can we do? First, let's notice the following thing. The two kinds of representations are somehow consistent. When we were very young as infants, we couldn't really do any intervention, right? We could just cry. We observe, right? We try to be secure. Basically, we try to make some prediction. We try to form some inner compact representation when we were very young. Later, we had the ability to make changes. We discovered a lot of causal relations. They seem to be consistent because there are no sudden big change between them. Now, given this, let's try to, and uh, today I'm not going to talk about how to really achieve this, achieve a general purpose AI system. That's another story. But today, we want to have a look at the connection between, between You guys, <laughs> we want to see. Oh, we want to hear that. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> after talk, let's talk. So basically, we want to see the connection between the two kinds of representations. And then you have, we are going to answer the following three questions. First, we just analyze the data, observational data, and then the relationship of the representation is somehow consistent with the causal representation. How can we really analyze observational data to find the causal relations? This is the first, uh, first issue, known as causal discovery. You see how we can solve the problem. The second one is, yes, the first representation is really useful for transfer learning or domain adaptation because you, with this, you can, do, you can make very good predictions across all scenarios. That's basically transfer learning, right? Now you can see, oh, yes, clearly the second issue is that how can we really make use of causal representations to improve our ability to do transfer learning, right? Suppose I know something about the causality in this system, how can we make use of it to do transfer learning? This is the second issue. The third issue is, yes, we can use causality. It's not necessary because not all everything involved in this representation is causal, right? That means, yeah, probably we don't have, if we are giving data, only data, Probably we don't have to go to the causal level. We can make use of something else, which is kind of similar to causality, to really do transfer learning. What's that, right? So you want to find an efficient way to encode the particular essential property of the data distribution to make transfer to achieve transfer learning. What's that? So I'm going to focus on those three uh, issues, and I will take questions during the talk. So if you have any questions, please let me know. 
we distinguish between causal connections and association information. This is the example, basically the news report from Telegraph. Couples who share housework are more likely to divorce. It's horrible, right? So we really want to see whether this is causal or just associational. That's why there was a lot of follow-up discussions. Does sharing housework really lead to divorce? We care about such questions because we want to see what we can do to improve your life, right? Association information, most of the time, doesn't really make sense. But for machines, that makes sense because they make prediction. This caricature, I think almost all of you right know this caricature, basically explains my experience. When I was very young, I, yes, if I see something uh, with very strong, you see very strong correlations or very strong dependency, yeah, there's a causality, there's some causal relation. Later, because of very famous claim or statement in statistics, causation implies correlation, but the correlation doesn't imply causation, right? A lot of people just change their minds. However, after doing research in this field for, as you said, about 13 years, so now I'm very optimistic. Basically, I can say that in almost all situations, if you believe that the causal relations take place between given measured variables, then we can always discover causal direction and causal relations. However, this is the only part of the story. In a lot of situations, we don't have a causality between observed variables. We have a causality between hidden variables. We only observe a lot of reflections of those two underlying causal variables. This is much harder. And we are basically, a couple, uh, couple of people are currently doing this problem. Hopefully, within five years, you can see some very good solutions, maybe because of you. Okay, what's causality? Basically, we say X is cause Y if intervention. If you basically, intervention on X can give you different values or different distribution of Y, then by, when you do intervention, basically you only change the value of X. Everything else in the system, at least for the moment, is the same as before. That's why whenever you observe a change in the distribution of Y, you know, oh, this is because of the change intervention on X. That's why X causes Y. So clearly, if they are causally related, generally speaking, they are associated. They are associated if and only if they are dependent. It's much weaker. Okay. In reality, in many situations, we really want to discover causal information from observational data. This is a particular example. So basically, this paper says large-scale psychological differences within China can be explained by rice versus wheat agriculture. So there are some explanations. I'm going to skip this. If you are really interested, you can read the paper. But basically, here you can see, in this kind of scenario, we cannot do intervention. Even if you are very powerful, you can force people right, to farm different things. You have to wait really long to really see the effect. right? So we have to analyze data. We have to make use of statistical properties of data. This is another, uh, another uh, application, another uh, example. Basically, my collaborator, uh, Marlene Nobeck from the Netherlands. And her last name is very cool, Nobeck, just go forward. So, <laughs> so she collected 255 skeletons all over the world and measured eight variables. They really want to see how those variables are causally related because they really want to see why those features include um, sex, cranial size, right here, uh, diet, what you eat, climate, cranial, cranial shape differentiation, basically what this part looks like. So they really want to see why people in different areas look different. They want to see why. And then they want to make prediction to the future, uh, giving something that will happen uh, in the future. So this is a very interesting problem, but you can see we cannot really do interventions. We have no choice but to analyze the data. Okay. You are going to see how we can make use of independence to solve this problem. But basically, we make use of independence, different levels of independence to find the causal structure. And then after that, you can see how we can do transfer learning also by making use of independence or some particular type of independent modularity. Basically, that's why independence is a really essential property or essential concept in causality. How can we really discover causal information, causal structure from data? observational data. First of all, we know that if you have a causal structure, valid causal structure, we can see a set of independence and conditional independence relations. 
given by the Markov condition, called the Markov condition, right? If x calls y, if y calls x, and uh, x calls z, in this way, suppose they are no corresponder. Then we know y and z are conditionally independent of uh, given x, because there are no other way for y to be related to, to z. Meaning that if I fix the value of x, then no matter how this guy changes, this one will not be changed by, uh, by that. They are conditionally independent given the middle thing. Each variable is conditionally independent from its non-descendants given its parents. This is Markov condition. So from this condition, you can see, oh, we can see independence relation in the data if we are given the graph. Now we want to do, to solve the inverse problem. We want to go from the independent property in the data Right? That can be discovered from data back to the color graph. What can we do? If they are independent, basically, you can see the contrapositive of the con uh, Markov condition says that if they are dependent, then they are not, they are, rigorously speaking, they are de deconnected. If they are uh, dependent, then they are deconnected. This makes no sense because we cannot really see any sparse graph if you make use, the, uh, make use of this property, right? We can only start with dependence to say, uh, to the conclusion that they are deconnected. But we want, really want to find a sparse graph to explain the data. What can you do? You have to make use of another assumption which is known as faithfulness. This faithfulness is uh, almost the same as the faithfulness in the relations. It says all observed independence relations in the data can be seen from the graph by applying Markov condition. It means there are no fake or extra of spurious independent relations. Whenever you see independent relations in the data, right, it's a property of the graph. Then because of this assumption, we know oh, there is uh, some connection between color graph and the statistical property of the data. Then, okay, from here, you can derive the following procedure. This is the PC uh, algorithm to uh, discover causal relations from data. We make use of conditional independent relations. And in particular, this set of method is known as a constraint-based method. Here, by constraint, I mean conditional independent, independence or conditional independence constraints. So from data, you can discover a lot of constraints. Independence, conditional independence relations. And then you want to find a deck or a set of decks to satisfy those constraints. And you can show from the previous condition and assumption, you can show that, oh, if they are independent or conditional independent, then clearly there are no edge between them. They are not adjacent. You can show this. Now I can say, oh, I started with this graph. I know one, three are not adjacent. I know one, four are not adjacent. I know three and four are not uh, adjacent. You can directly see this from the graph. Oh, sorry, from the distribution, uh, distribution of information. Now, one, three, independent. This is the only way for them to be independent. Otherwise, right, you are going there. Otherwise, they must share information. They cannot be independent. So this is known as a V structure. And then you can go further. This is not a base structure because they are not independent. Uh, they are independent, given this guy, right? Clearly, they, this guy cannot go this way because if this guy goes this way, it means, oh, before you, condition, before you consider this guy, they are not related, right? After you condition this guy, consider this guy, they become de uh, dependent, which is different from what we observe from data. That's why this direction must go this way. This is called orientation propagation. You can find the base structure and the directions and then you can go further by propagation. Okay, so here you can see a summary, very dense summary of the whole procedure. Basically, this method, PC or other constraint-based method for causal discovery, uh, makes use of conditional independent relations. They rely on causal Markov condition and the faithfulness assumption. And typical algorithm is the PC algorithm. P is for Peter Svartis, C is for Clark Glimmer. And basically, there are two steps. First step is to determine the skeleton undirected graph for the, from the data. And the second step is to find the V-structure and do orientation propagation. If all those decks uh, discovered from data have the same direction everywhere, then it's, it's just a deck because all directions are uh, consistent. Otherwise, if, you, if the same edge can have different directions across different solutions, then we just use the undirected graph, undirected edge right here. In this case, suppose this is the true ground truth, we know y is independent given x. All those three graphs will satisfy the same set of independent relations. Then we say, oh, basically, they are, they are not adjacent, they are adjacent, they are adjacent. We cannot determine the direction because each of them can go in either way. 
Okay, this is known as a pattern or mark of equivalence class. So this is a, now we can see how uh, this method works on this data set. We apply the PC method combined with uh, our kernel-based condition independent test method. This is the output of the method. A lot of edges are directed. Some of them are not, right? And if you further make use of some background information, you can go much further. This is the, oh. So this is the location, basically. This is the climate. Climate shouldn't be a cause of location, right? So I know this guy should go this way. If this guy goes this way, this guy must go this way. Otherwise, you are going to have a fake V structure, okay? So all of a sudden, by making use of some background information, I have a DAG. And a lot of relations here, uh, reported here, have been discussed in the literature. For instance, this one. This one says climate causes cranial size. You can see that in very cold places, usually people have a larger kind of cranial size. It's because if it's very cold, then it's better to warm the air longer, longer, right? Before it really uh, exhaust uh, the, the air. That's why this part tend to be bigger. And so on, there are a lot of explanations in archaeology. Furthermore, from data, we recover not only those things, but with more details. So in the literature, they said, oh, diet is uh, what you eat, basically. is the cause of a cranial shape differentiation. Essentially, what you eat will change your looks. We, from data, we say, yes, that's true. This is the cause. However, relative to this set of variables, this is not a direct cause. This cause influence takes place via another two variables. So from data, you can really discover more detailed or more complete causal picture. Yeah. Sorry, what was, what was the, the, the kernel-based conditional independence test? I'm curious what, why you had to innovate on the conditional independence testing. Uh, so basically, we, uh, this is just, should I say this? What should I say? Oh, okay, so now I see. Basically, you, uh, if you want to apply such method, you have to make use of independent condition independent relations. You have to see whether variable are conditionally independent. Right. So basically, this is just a non parametric method for conditional independence test. Okay, so that wasn't a contribution, it was just you, were just, you had a non parametric method that you found and then used it. Okay. You are to the right, yeah. This is just a kind of module, which is called a function. Yeah, wonderful. So now, so far, we haven't really seen anything about the confounder. By confounder, I mean a hidden direct cause of two variables, right? Hidden direct cause of two variables. And what if you have confounders? You only measure a, a, a finite number of variables. Can you really say anything about the confounders? This is really cool, because if you can say something about confounder, essentially you can say something universal regarding the universe, right? Given only a finite set of variables. The answer is yes. In, some, in a lot of situations, you can really say something about the confounders. Let's just have a look at two examples. In the first example, basically this is a graph we just discovered. One, two independent, one for independent giving three, two for independent giving three. Right? If you assume there are no confounders, this is the graph. Now the question is whether it's possible to have a confounder behind three and four. Do you think it's possible at all to have a confounder there given this set of independent relations? The answer is no. If you have a confounder here, then basically x1 and x4 will be deconnected given x3. This is not going to be the case. The same thing happened to uh, the relationship between 2 and 4 given 3. So in this case, suppose the independent relations are really, really uh, oracle. Basically, suppose we are very confident about that. Then we are very sure that there are no confounder between 3 and 4. And furthermore, we say x3 must be a direct cause of x4. So this is really informative, right? Okay, now the scenario. You can look at the example later, okay? So suppose you observe the independence, those independent relations. One, three independent, one, four independent, two, three independent. Of course, in, in reality, you can condition on some variable, doesn't matter. Basically, do you think there are confounders between two and four? So this is a graph. One, three, not adjacent, because they are independent. One, four, not adjacent. Two, three, not adjacent. Two, four, not adjacent. This is the graph. So now you can see the following thing. One, four, independent. So if there are no confounder, then this guy must go this way. 
Otherwise, they share information, right? This guy must go this way. Two and three are independent, meaning that this guy, this direction, this edge must go this way. You can see contradiction. Why do we have the contradiction? It's because of confounder. So in this case, we can conclude that there must be confounders between x2 and x4. And furthermore, you can say, definitely there's no direct causal relation between x2 and x4. So in many situations, you can really say something about the confounders by making use of only conditional independence relations. Okay. Unfortunately, if you make use of conditional independent relations, most of the time, you cannot really uniquely identify the deck because you have the equivalent class. You can only identify all the decks which have the same set of independent relations. Now let's try to go further. And here you can see some examples. We are giving different data pairs. Each time we are giving only two variables. We have no idea about the temporal information. So there are no temporal uh, pre uh, precedence information. We are giving ID data. We are giving, each time we are giving x1, x2, a number of data points. And then we want to determine which one is the cause and which one is the effect. What can we do? Clearly, we cannot make use of a condition of independent relations because we have only two variables, right? So now you can see, oh, you have to assume something slightly stronger. Then you can, all of a sudden, you can discover a lot of information regarding the process. Here you can see a number of uh, functional classes. Basically, in the first one, the effect the linear function of the cause is plus noise. This is the linear model. And we assume the noise term non Gaussian. Then this is the linear non Gaussian model. And in the second case, the effect the nonlinear function of the cause plus noise. The third case, you further have nonlinear distortion or measurement error, or measurement distortion in the data. Basically, if the true generating process, causal process, follows either of them, this one is the most general one, follows this model, then in theory, you can show that the reverse direction, wrong direction, cannot, fall, cannot give you independent noise. For the correct causal direction, we have independent noise. But for the wrong direction, you can never discover or estimate independent noise. This will give you asymmetry between the two variables. And that's why we can uniquely identify the causal direction. Here you can see some uh, illustration. I generated x first, and then I generated y. So y is the effect of x with some noise, right? This is the functional form, causal process, mechanism. First, let's consider joint Gaussian case. Right here, x is Gaussian, and e, the noise term is Gaussian. So basically, everything is Gaussian. All variables are jointly Gaussian in this case. I try to explain why the effect with the cause by linear regression. This is the residual. You can see the residual is uncorrelated from the cause from the predictor by construction. And in the Gaussian case, as long as they are uncorrelated, they are independent. The same thing happens in the reverse direction. I try to explain x, the cause with the effect with linear, by linear regression. The residual is uncorrelated and hence independent from y. They are symmetric. x and y are symmetric. Cause, effect are symmetric. This is another scenario. Here, x is uniform. Noise is also uniform. Now you can see, oh, if I try to explain why with x, basically I just estimate, recover the underlying true causal mechanism. The residual is clearly independent from x because I use the independent residual. Here, the residual, if there are no confounder, then the uh, noise term here must be independent from x. Otherwise, uh, there must be confounder. There must be some other way for x and y to be related, meaning that there must be some confounder. That's why we can say if there are no confounder, then the noise must be independent from x, from the cause. And then let's try to explain the if cause x from, uh, by making use of the effect y. You do linear regression. Yes, the residual will be uncorrelated from the predictor by construction. Whenever you do regression, they are uncorrelated. However, as you can see from this scatter plot, clearly they are dependent. They are not independent. The distribution of the other variable will be very sensitive to the value of y, right? As you can see from this uh, scatter plot. So this means, oh, generally speaking, this is just an example, but generally speaking, as long as at least one of them is non Gaussian, then we can, we can recover the causal direction because wrong causal direction will not give you independent error term, although the error term is uncorrelated from the predictors. 
And here you can see basically, I just talked about two the variable case. We, you can handle a lot of variables. Here you can see some application in uh, stock market analysis. Here basically we analyze the daily returns of a lot of stocks uh, in Hong Kong market, Hong Kong stock market. Basically, all major relations are kind of consistent with the, ground, with the uh, domain knowledge. Here, for instance, this guy, this is, HS, this is the Hong Seng Bank. This is HSBC. HSBC holds something like 60% of uh, Hong Seng Bank. Then you can see the causal relation from Hong Seng to HSBC, and so on. Okay, I'll skip this. Previously, we assumed that everything was linear. Clearly, it's too strong, right? In reality, we really want to make use of a very flexible model to approximate the process. At the same time, we want to guarantee that even with this very flexible model, the causal direction is identifiable. The cause and the effect are not symmetric in terms of this model. That's, uh, so we come, up with, we come up with this model called the post nonlinear model 13 years ago. Yeah, so basically, uh, the effect is the nonlinear distorted version of the nonlinear function of the cause and the noise. This is very important because very often times we have a sensor distortion, measurement distortion, right? When, whenever you use an uh, instrument to measure something, right? Very often times you have uh, some additional distortion. So put them together, we have this model. We have two nonlinear functions. And you can see this model is rather general. For instance, even if the noise is multiplicative, not additive, you can see, oh, it's nothing but a special case of this model, right? So now, with this model, but we applied this model to the uh, causality challenge, the second causality challenge. Basically, with this method, we correctly identified all, all causal directions. That's why this changed a lot of people's mind. Now you can see a particular data set. This is data set eight. Uh, we have data points. Right here, you can see the data points. And we first assume x, x1 calls x2. We fit the model, estimate the nonlinear functions, and the noise. The noise is independent from the, uh, from the hypothetical cause. Then we assume x2 calls x1. We want to see which one is more plausible. And then we estimate the noise and nonlinear functions. You can see the noise is not independent, not independent from the uh, hypothetical cause, which is x2. So basically, we say that causal direction should go from x1 to x2. Actually, x1 is the age of a lot of people, and x2 is a wage per hour. Clearly, x1 should cause x2, but not the other, the other way around. Yeah. What is the second? Is this assuming no measurement noise in the parent variables? This is the perfect. Is this assuming no noise in the parent variables? That was the question. This is a wonderful question. Yes. And later you can see how you have to deal with the measurement error. Wonderful. You are, you are totally right. Okay, otherwise, basically the true variable for the cause is the confounder. Yeah. Okay, so you can see, yes, empirically speaking, we can really discover causal direction and the causal model from data even if there are no temporal information. Right, we are giving ID data. So let me show some theory. Empirically, yes, it works. But can we really guarantee that? Essentially, we just uh, tackle this problem with a proof of contradiction. We assume x1 calls x2. We have the data. Then we have the distribution implied by the data. Now let's see whether the same distribution can be explained by the wrong causal model, wrong causal direction. How can we really solve the problem? We assume the same data can also be explained by wrong direction, which is from x1, from x2 to x1, right? Now let's see in what situations this can be the case. After solving some equations, differential equations, you can see, oh, in only five situations, this is the case. Meaning that in only five situations, given data generated this way, the cause and effect are symmetric because even for the wrong direction, you can find the independent noise. But apart from those five situations, cause and effect are not symmetric. You can discover causal direction. Those five cases are very specific. The first one is the linear Gaussian case, right? You already saw the picture. In the linear Gaussian case, basically the causal direction, the information of causal direction just disappears. All of them are very specific. You have to tune the nonlinear functions and the distribution very carefully so that one of them holds true. Means that generally speaking, we can discover causal direction from data, even if, they, even if the data were generated by this very general, very flexible model. By the way, it's very interesting to see uh, why the linear Gaussian case, which is supposed to be very simple, right, uh, turned out to be so, so strange. 
In the linear Gaussian case, we cannot find the causal direction. Why? Because central limit theorem. If you have sum of independent variables, right, and if the number of independent variables is infinity, we have a Gaussian distribution, right? On the contrary, we have the Cramer decomposition theorem, which says that if the sum of any finite number of independent variables is Gaussian, then any of them, all of them are Gaussian. This means, oh, when, when, I, when I really discover C Gaussian distribution, I already, the process already converges, right? If the process converges, then the process information disappears. You only observe something that is fixed, right? But before that, you can always recover the process information, which is the causal information from distributions. Okay, so now, first let's have a look at a lot of practical issues we have to deal with in causal discovery. Why do we have to deal with those situations? This is because we have to analyze the data. The data were generated by not only the causal process, but also how you measure the data, right? So you have to deal with nonlinearities. You have to deal with not only continuous variables, but also categorical variables and the mixed cases. We have a lot of papers, basically, uh, yeah, we publish uh, those papers to deal with those situations. You have to deal with memory error. The memory error is a really important issue. And we just published some papers um, on how to deal with memory errors in different situations. You have to deal with selection bias for causal discovery because selection bias can change the dependency relation, dependent pattern in the data. Confounding is the most important thing uh, in causal discovery. Here, I, have, I observe one, two. However, there's a variable Z as a direct common cause of them. Unfortunately, Z is not observable. What can we do? Can we discover true causal relations? So basically, we are trying to solve this problem. We observe a lot of variables, Xi's. They were generated by some hidden variables and the hidden variables are causally related. You can consider those variables as concepts, right? You see a lot of images. Those images were generated by a lot of concepts. Those concepts are related, right? So how can you, this makes no sense because what you observe is nothing but reflections of the underlying true causal variables. You have to go to this level to really make, mean, uh, make uh, sense of the data. What can we do? How, under what condition can you really recover this kind of deep, representation, graphical representation of the data. We call this confounding network discovery because this is something like a confounding network. And also you can see the relationship between this and the deep learning. This also explains why we have to use deep structures in a lot of scenarios. Okay, missing values, you have to deal with missing values because if you just ignore missing values, uh, you can have extra or uh, fake conditional dependence relation in the data. So we have uh, some publications there and Causality in time series is a traditional problem. You have temporal information. However, if you really want to apply Granger causality, right, to the data, in order to, for the discover the causal relation to be really causal, you have to make very strong assumptions. You assume the unknown confounder. You assume you have the data recorded at the right frequency, right resolution, and so on. So to solve those problems, basically, we could as the at time delayed the causal relations as well as the instantaneous causal relations or very fast causal relations, we can discover true causal relations from low resolution data. Here by low resolution data, I mean you may have subsampled data or aggregated data, like daily returns. The daily return is nothing but the sum of a lot of local or short-term returns. So, and also you uh, have to deal with um, causal discovery from uh, partially observed processes. Some of them right, are not observable. How can you really recover the true causality uh, between those observed variables? Basically, we made some progress uh, in those lines, uh, those, lines, uh, sorry, those lines of research. Furthermore, recommended systems. If you really want to design recommended system, you care about the causality because you make this particular recommendation to change the behavior, right? If you just want to make a prediction, then this is nothing but recommendation for convenience. I know you want to buy this. That's why I recommend the same thing to you, right? But what you really want to do is to make, make changes, um, to, uh, to change the user behavior. For instance, if you want to improve the revenue, maybe you want to find a way so that the user will buy more products in the long run. 
And if you want to make the world better, you want to find a way so that the user will be more fair, open-minded, and so on. So that means whenever you design any recommend system, you have to come up with some goal to achieve. And then you can make use of some cause inference uh, techniques to achieve your goal. And then finally, non-stationary and heterogeneous data. We observe such data very often in reality. If you have time series, as time goes on, the distribution of the data can be different, can change. This is non-stationarity. If you have multiple data sets collected in different locations under different conditions, then the distribution can be very different. This is known as heterogeneous data. So how can we find the causality from such data? Uh, from the purely statistical perspective, non-stationary data is really, really horrible because I don't have a fixed distribution, right? However, from a causal perspective, we really enjoy analyzing non-stationary data because causality and non-stationarity or distribution shift are heavily coupled. We care about the causality because we want to make changes, right? In other, word, in other words, causal model tells us how the distribution may change. To make it more specific, suppose x causes y, raining causes weather ground. What do we mean by that? There's the process to generate x, there's another process to generate y, the effect from x. The two processes are not related, they are separated. Meaning that, oh, I can have changes in px, I can have changes in py, given x. They are not related, right? And we can easily uh, discover and verify those conditions from non-stationary data. That's why, generally speaking, with non-stationary data, we can uh, discover causal information more easily. Let's see how we can deal with the problem. Basically, we want to answer the following questions. How can we find where the mechanisms change? Means that um, we want to discover the variables for which the generating process changes. So we can do so. Suppose this is the ground truth. From data, we know, oh, for V1, V2, and V4, the mechanism change. And furthermore, how can you discover the true causal skeleton? And the third problem is, how can you find the direction? In the non-stationarity non case, it's really interesting that we can find the direction more easily because we can make use of independent changes in probability, distribution of the cause, and distribution of the effect given the cause because of modularity, right? We have separate independent modules. This is one module, this is another. They are not related. They are, if you have non-stationary data, we can say they change independently, although each of them is a high-dimensional object distribution. But we don't care. We can verify whether they are independent or not. So we can easily find the direction by making use of independent changes. And finally, we can also do some non-parental method to uh, estimate, to, have a, to produce a one di uh, low dimensional representation of the non-stationarity. I know this, I know this causal relation, this causal mechanism changes. How can I really visualize how it changes? Basically, you just want to find a low dimensional representation of the conditional distribution across different scenarios or over time. Okay, so let me say a few more words about independent changes. This is really a very nice thing uh, if you have non-stationary non -stationary or multiple domain data. Basically, independent changes between the cause distribution and the distribution of the effect given the cause. And this independence is generally violated in wrong causal directions. There are some special cases. I think you are familiar with some of them. In this case, we, ha we have invariant cause. Basically, C is a surrogate. If C points to this guy, we say, oh, this distribution, this mechanism, the mechanism for this guy changes. This guy is not adjacent to C. And furthermore, we know, oh, this guy is independent from C, giving some other variables. Then we can say, basically, we have an invariant cause. VI is the invariant cause. That's why the direction goes from VI to VK. This is invariant cause. This is another scenario. Here, yeah, VL is independent from v, uh, C, given some set of variables containing VK. This is very different. Now you can see, although the distribution, marginal distribution of VL changes, however, the conditional distribution of VL given VK will be the same. We say this is an invariant mechanism. Basically, if you have those invariant properties, you can discover causal relations. And the independent change is just a generalization of invariance. You can make use of that, and you can discover that. And here you can see, basically, 
you can discover correlation uh, by making use of uh, changes. So here you can see application. We analyze the number of stocks, uh, basically the daily returns of a lot of stocks in NYSE. You can find the skeleton of the direction, and you can find you can see very nice patterns. Those companies in the same sector are closely related. Between different sectors, the causal relations are kind of more sparse. And basically, we try to interpret the results here. They seem to be consistent with the uh, uh, domain knowledge. And also, furthermore, we have the non stationarity or visualization of the non stationarity of the causal mechanism here. This is a USB, I forgot which one it is. Uh, basically, this is how the causal mechanism to generate USB, stock return, daily return, changed over time. This is the 2008, this is 2007, financial crisis, right? You can see, oh, something's totally different from before. And actually, this line, this curve is very, uh, very similar to the so-called curve of TED spread, TED spread, which provides a way to, uh, to analyze the risk in the market calculated in a very complex way. Basically, you can see this line is consistent with that. And furthermore, uh, you, here in 2007, the risk is already very, 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 uh, very high. But in 2000, uh, 2008, clearly the risk is even higher. Yeah. But does your method need to identify uh, different environments uh, separately, or it can automatically figure out the non stationary That's a wonderful question. You don't need to do that. You don't need to basically segment the uh, data sets. You just need to, it's non-stationary, right? You can use something like a kernel method to make use of the all data uh, at the same time. Okay, finally, let me see how much time I have. Let me spend uh, about 10 minutes on this part, transfer learning. Why do we need the causal models? First of all, if you want to make changes, if you want to intervene on something, or if you want to make proper changes to achieve your goal, clearly you want to make use of causal models, right? This is, a, I think we, all of us agree with that. In many situations, we don't really want to, uh, to do intervention. We just want to make a prediction, right? So in this, in this sense, causal model provides a compact description of the properties of the joint distribution. Remember the example. Rainy wet ground, right? X causes Y. Then the two processes are not related. Basically, if you observe multiple realizations of the process, then the multiple distribution will follow some property given by the causal structure, by the causal model. Now, let's try to do the following thing. With the same causal process, we can observe a lot of distributions but with different parameters or different causal models, right? So how can we jump from one particular distribution to another? Suppose here, right, we are familiar with this scenario. We know x, y value, we can predict y from x. In the next scenario, I, uh, I just observe something. I want to predict y. I want to transfer information from this place to this place, to another place, right? What can we do? So first of all, if we have no idea about the relationship between them, then it's not possible to do uh, proper transfer learning because you have no idea what to transfer. If they are arbitrarily different, you cannot do anything. And second of all, you can see causal state structure is rather stable. We can make use of this. This is the bridge, right? I jump back to the bridge, then I can jump to another place by making use of a new proper parameter, right? So this is the transfer learning. Basically, we have uh, uh, data from uh, some uh, old data or source domain data in which we have both the values for the features and the, the value for the class label or regression target. We have x, y values. And in the future, we collect data, only the feature values, and then we want to make prediction. Clearly, the distribution, the distribution can be very different. This is different from the classical setting in which the distribution is always fixed, right? You always have ID sampling from some distribution. Now we have different distributions. So we just want to jump from some places to some other place, and we know something can change. What can we do? First of all, we want to, I want to convince you that clearly, yeah. Just, just to understand the setting of the previous slide, uh, there are two things happening. One, the distribution is changing, and you are measuring different columns, because you just measure the x in the testing. You don't measure the y there. Is in the target so? domain, yeah. Correct. Yeah. Okay, then two things. One, there is something happening between P1 and P2 that is changing. And the other one, you have different measurements. That's correct? This is the setting? Yeah. Okay. So uh, 
for classical transfer learning domain detection, uh, with a single source domain, you're right. In the target domain, we don't have a Y value. We want to estimate it. And a lot of people, including Sarah, basically focus on the multiple source domain scenario. You have multiple source, source domains in which you have both X and Y. Now you have the same. Yeah, you are, you are totally right. You are totally right. OK. So let's just consider this example. Very simple example. Suppose this is me, right? You can see my figure, my shadow. Now, suppose I go to a new environment, completely new environment. First question, if you see my shadow, can you predict anything about my figure? Yeah. Can you? Yeah, OK. Why is big? Oh, let's talk about why later. So this is the first one. Second, if you see my figure, can you see my shadow? Can you predict anything about my shadow? Do you know how long it is? Do you know where it is? Oh? Yeah, that's, that's true. You just see me. Suppose you just care about me. <laughs> so can you really see anything? No, right? Why is that? And furthermore, what's the causal direction? This is because here, this is the cause, this is the effect, right? In our experience, daily life experience, we already learned a lot regarding this mapping, causal mechanism. We learned a lot constraints regarding the relationship between this guy and that guy, right? And then by making use of that constraint and some property here, we can recover this guy perfectly. Okay, this is because causality provides a set of constraints that you can make use of more intuitively. The effect contains the information of the cause as well as information from the environment, including where the light is from and so on, right? That's why with some constraints, you can separate the effect of the cause from the rest, meaning that you can recover the information of the cause from the effect even if the environment is non-stationary, right? In contrast, if you only look at the cause, there must be some information in the effect that cannot be explained by the cause, right? That's why without strong, stronger assumptions, you cannot really predict the effect from cause, but the prediction in the reverse direction would be much easier, generally speaking, if you have non-stationary environments. Right? And here you can see basically we know causal direction and we know causal um, constraints. That's why we can do a lot of things. The, the idea is if why the thing you want to predict is, yeah? I was just going to point out that's a good example for, so not just transfer learning, but semi supervised learning to. Yeah, totally right. It's on the direction, yeah. Yeah, totally right. Okay. So, Fortunately, in classification as well as regression, in many situations, a lot of situations, why the thing you want to predict is actually the cause of what you see of the features. Right here, what, you, what digit you want to write down is the cause of the digit you actually have. Here, the disease which you want to predict, right, is the cause of the symptoms and so on. That's why you have this causal model. And you can have changes here, you can have a change in the conditional distribution, and you can have a change in both, in the distribution of Y and the conditional distribution or the mechanism. However, because of the previous intuition or illustration, we know as long as Y causes X, we can solve this problem. We can do transfer learning fairly easily, even if we have no idea about the Y value in the target domain. We, we are given only the feature values, right? We can do that. So you can see the method uh, in quite some papers. Here you can see our application. Basically, it's a remote sensing image classification problem. We have a lot of remote sensing uh, images, and we want to do classification. In total, we have 14 classes. Uh, we have two different areas. Now you can see you can do transfer learning from 1 to 2 and from 2 to 1. Basically, with this model, we can the misclassification mis rate uh, was reduced from 21% to 12% and from 20, uh, 26% to 14% in the two scenarios. You can really benefit a lot from the understanding of the underlying causal process. Here you can see another scenario. Essentially, still you can see Y generates X, 
right? And we have some different deep network to explain the generating process. In different, across the domains, we have very low dimensional representation of the changes. That's why we can really see, oh, with, between domains, we can see the change in the causal mechanism with this structure. We are given a source domain in which we have class level and a target domain, we don't have class level, right? We do transfer learning by making use of this structure. And we have theta, one dimension of theta, to explain why the distribution in the target domain is different from the distribution we have in the source domain. In the source domain, we found our oh, theta takes this value, and the target domain, the theta has this value. They are very different. That's why the two distributions are different. If theta value is the same, then distribution must be the same, because everything else is shared across different domains. OK, what's more interesting is as follows. I observe, I use this structure, I can change theta value after I estimate the deep network, right? You can see what happens. Oh, I change the theta value. Now I see, basically, we just learned that, oh, it's only the change in the angle. You can discover that. And I think this is how we understand the difference across different scenarios. We want to find a compact representation of the difference, right? And then we make use of a difference, make a prediction. Okay. Now, let's consider another more general uh, problem, uh, question. You can see that in transfer learning, causality really helps. If you know causal relations, and if you assume the data will generate a kind of perfect sample from the underlying causal model, yes, causality helps because causality provides some constraints, right? You can make use of. Uh, and you can further make, if you have a causal structure, you can further make use of invariance in the relations, right? It's invariance based prediction. Sarah did some very nice work in this line, uh, this line of research. Now, the question is, uh, do we really need to use causality or causal picture for transfer learning, right? Probably we don't have to go that far. Essentially, we just want to, want to, we are giving data. We just want to make use of the data to discover how the joint distribution changes. And then we want to make use of the changes to make use, to predict, uh, to produce the optimal prediction. That's all. So this inspires the following way of following automated method for domain adaptation. We are giving multiple domain data. From data, you want to find a graph or something to encode the changes. In particular here, if this guy has a theta variable, it means, oh, this guy, the mechanism, the conditional distribution of this guy given his parents can be different across different scenarios. That's all. Those things are independent. We guarantee that. Those variables are independent. That's why we have independent changes between px1 and py given x1 different modules, right? We discover that from data. I make use of causal discovery from non-stationary data or a lot of methods, right? However, we don't need to assume anything. We just discover the property of the data. It's not necessarily causal. And then, what's domain adaptation? Basically, in the target domain, we are giving information of the features. Given those values, we just, it's nothing but inference of the y values on this graphical model, given the observed data for other features. So this, in this way, domain adaptation or transfer learning is nothing but inference on graphical models, right? You can discover everything from data. You make use of prior distribution, discover from data and structure from data. You make use of target domain data, it's done. This graph is not necessarily causal, this graph. Let me just give a single example. So suppose this is the underlying two causal process, Y cause X, uh, maybe disease, symptoms, clinics, right? We just assign patients to different clinics according to their symptoms. However, if you have data generated this way and apply color discovery method or graph, uh, graphical model learning, uh, learning method from non-stationary data, you are going to learn this graph. Px can change, py game x is always the same across the scenario. Why? This is because y is conditionally independent from s. Py game s is the same as py game x and s. So py game x is the same. This is what we discover from the data. Clearly, this is not causal, right? But this is a valid, compact representation of the change property of the data. That's enough. And then you can make use of this graphical model and observe the values in the target domain to make a prediction. And here you can see a, a, a simple uh, application of the idea. Basically, you want, suppose this is a, here we have a, someone uh, we want to predict the location from the 
Wi-Fi signal strength is. We have a lot of routers, and right here, he, can, he or she can receive signals uh, from different routers, and from the strength is of the signal, we want to predict the location of the, of the person. That's the uh, setup. So we can do this, we can measure the signal, we can measure everything from different time, uh, different time periods, and then we can do transfer learning. To say we can use the uh, signal that we, made, we recorded in the morning and the noon to be predict something uh, that, that is happening in the evening. So we want to transfer learning. This is, uh, first of all, from data. We have multiple domains. We have data, signal strength is, we have wide location. We can first construct a graph. The graph to encode the distribution property uh, of the data. And then, by making use of this graph and the target domain data, we can make a prediction. So here you can see the result accuracy given by different methods. This is by domain invariant component analysis. So basically it's a 29%. And with this method, automatic way of transfer learning is 64%. You can really see a big gap between the result given by this method, automated approach, and other approaches. Because here we can really um, somehow optimally make use of the property of the data, change the property of the data. Of course, the prediction should be more flexible, and at the same time, you don't assume, um, you don't assume anything that is fake. That's why it's, uh, the result is clearly uh, superior to other, to other results. Okay, to summarize, we care about the causality. Even in machine learning, right, if you want to deal with the problem of uh, adversarial attack, you really have to find a way to derive the features we are using to the classification. Otherwise, if you know the features the machines are using are different from our features, clearly you can always do something like attack. And we uh, can discover causal information from data by making use of different kinds of independence relations. With the condition independence, we can find a skeleton and uh, some directions, which um, basically which is known as the Markov equivalent class. With independent noise condition, uh, in some constrained functional color models, we can discover color direction, we can discover the whole deck uniquely. Furthermore, if you have non-stationary or multiple domain data, you can make use of independent changes in the color modules. This way you can discover direction as well as skeleton more easily. And also, if you want to do transfer learning, essentially you want to make use of a compact representation of the changes in the distribution, right? The more compact the model is, the better the prediction will be because you have fewer changing variables, right? You have fewer parameters to estimate. And here, modularity implied by causality clearly matters. If you have causality, causality implies modularity. And if you further assume what you observe is a perfect sample of the color model, then you can do transfer learning. Otherwise, if you just observe data, you can just make use of in the, uh, some graphical model to encode the independent changing property of the data, and then domain adaptation is nothing but inference on graphical models. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, basically, uh, a lot of collaborators, so I cannot acknowledge, and all of them one by one, but basically at least here. So, um, questions? So uh, specifically with regards to non-stationarity um, and, and say domain adaptation, many of the settings that I think about, um, the underlying causal model is not really on the variables that I observe, but rather on some hidden process. Um, how would you think through applying these types of techniques in that setting? Wonderful, look at this picture. Here you can see we have theta. See, it has the latent variable. You want to observe the generating process. You want to observe, you want to explain how the observed features were generated by making use of some hidden variable. You can think of theta i as a confounder. Yeah, you can do this and in a non-parameter way. Because in theory, you can prove the identifiability of the conditional distribution by making use of a non-parameter model for the generating process. Essentially, to make, uh, I can put it this way. You want to see why, suppose y generates x. You want to see why and how px given y, the generating process, changes across domains. And you want to encode such information in a very compact way. 
you can achieve that by making use of some structure like this. Is that the answer to your question? I stopped in the dark. <laughs> okay. Any other question? Also on the other side of the room, by the way, if by, by chance anybody has any question. Okay. Uh, so you said if you encode the changes in different environments appropriately in a graphical model, although it is not causal, that is still sufficient because the rest of the problem is just inference on a graphical model. Exactly. Uh, I mean, I don't exactly mean what, I don't exactly understand what you mean by just an inference on this graphical model because if I do not know in the target domain where my changes are going to be, how can you get the causality stuff wrong but just still have a graphical model but then still generalize? Okay, very good one. So whenever you do learning, you have to assume something. Even if you do uh, regression, right, you assume the future data points will follow the same distribution. That's why we can, you can guarantee that the learning model will have some capacity in the future, right? The same thing happened here. Basically, whenever you discover this model is an in, induction problem, you have to, where is it? The assumption that follows, you have a mother distribution, a hyper distribution regarding all variables to generate different distributions, right? And then you want to recover the property of the mother or hyper distribution represented by the graphical model, right? And in this, in this representation, you have structure, you also have the prior distribution of the theta variables, then basically you specify everything. Now in the new domain, target domain, you observe a set of values for those features. You are given structure, you are given prior distribution, you are given observed values for some variables, you do inference. Did that answer to your question? Yeah, but uh, I have a little bit of difficulty because um, you impose a prior on the thetas. You learn that from software. Yeah, you learn from, yeah. you, 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 oh, okay. You learn that from the data that you have already observed. With respect to that prior, you're just saying do an inference on the graphical model. Yeah, to the right. And you should be, okay. Yeah, to the right. So maybe one last question and then we should probably go to the poster session. Anybody? No, everybody's shy. Oh, no, okay, Kartike, Kartike has several questions. Well, you already have. Okay, so there's some recent work on uh, invariant risk minimization, which also seems to uh, attack the same problem that you're talking about. The causal graph is completely hidden and you have a projection, yeah. like in the form of an image that I see. Yeah. And what they advocate is, uh, I mean, there's a criterion, right? So I just want to know your comments. Is like, how is that? Uh, Very good one. Very good one. So basically, I would say invariance based prediction is a special case. You know, all of this part of the invariance, then I can make use of this relationship for prediction. However, this is far from optimal prediction. Because even if everything changes, we human beings can still make prediction. It's about how certain you are about that prediction, right? So ideally, you have to make use of not only invariance properties, but also everything that is informative right here, right? So that's why, basically, with the uh, inference on graphical model, you have posterior. You have certainty, right? So the point is, even if everything changes, you can still make non-trivial prediction. And in order to make optimum prediction, you have to find a way to incorporate such information. That's why it's more general. Okay, just about the setting. Are you assuming that you are measuring everything in the target as well? Say again? Are you assume, just so I'm trying to understand your setting here. What are the constraints and so on? Are you assuming that in the same way that I asked before, are you assuming that you measure all variables in the target? Or you don't measure Y as well or something? You don't measure Y in the target. target, okay, target. That's, your, okay. that's why you want to infer the Y value from X values. So it's unsupervised, unsupervised multi-source multi domain adaptation. No, you have finite. And the data, yeah. Okay, um, so maybe we can still uh, thank Kuhn again. Thank you very much. <laughs>